Welcome to Blaymore Forest Archaeological Walk with me, Liam Alex Heffron. This is stop number one of our walk, the entrance to the actual forest. Blaymore itself is a conifer commercial timber forest of belonged to Kielce and it's situated on a rise of land in Garna Grand Bog, which is situated in North Mayo, in Magauna in North Mayo. What's the significance of, of here at Blaymore is like at Kielce, some miles to the north, we have found evidence of Stone Age and Bronze Age farming settlements. Here we have the stone walls, these tombs, standing stones and stone rows belonging to two waves of farmers that settled here thousands of years ago. Now what happened, basically about five to six thousand years, was the first farmers came to Ireland. They came to Cajia, they would have cleared some of the upland forest that was probably already failing on the uplands and then used the, the pasture for their cattle, for their sheep and also planted crops. We have found from carbon dating of evidence and samples that we found in the nearby bog here, Gornigran, that we know that the farmers had also arrived here and had planted some crops and had grasslands with cattle and perhaps sheep as well. This was about five to 6,000 years ago, around 5,850 um, before the Common Era to about 5,300, when with the growth of the, the bog land that was already here, but, started, uh, but in, combined with the uh, rainfall, the increased rainfall, we saw the, the bog land growing and the first farmers eventually leaving this hillside. The forest regrew and the bog grew as well. Then later, during a temporary period of warmer uh, climate, the Bronze Age farmers came back. They had a smaller settlement here where they cleared some more of the forest and had their own crops and their own cattle. But that only lasted a few hundred years and eventually they left too. And slowly, from the Bronze Age right to the present, the bog more or less grew steadily, engulfing these general area and eventually climbing up the Blaine Moor Ridge. Then in the 1960s, Kilsha bought some of the land off the farmers and planted their trees, and hence why we have the conifer woodland here today. And from then on, we have, through a combination of discoveries, we've reclaimed and re-seen these tombs and stone walls, uh, stand, standing stones and stone rows of the first farmers. And today on our tour, we're going to investigate each of these. So come and join me. This is stop 2A. This is where we see some pre-bog walls. Now at Blaine Moor, similar to the Cajun Fields complex off the North Mayo coast, we find pre-bog wall systems. And essentially what they are is a very simple thing. It's ordinary walls of the first farmers as they clear the land and formed um, these walls, in this case made up of granite rocks and probably smaller stones, to define their fields and field systems. Now over the last five to 6,000 years as the bog grew, it eventually engulfed the walls and their fields and their tombs and their, their houses and eventually um, oh, completely uh, covered them. But then as the bog has been cut away, in this case it's been um, cut for bog, uh, for turf use and also in this case for forestry. It's exposed some of the rocks of the wall. And here we can see this wall running from the top of the small hill down under our pathway and runs back into the bog again. And they're made up, this case, of granite boulders. Granite is a very common rock here. It's been deposited here by the glacial activity uh, and of, the, of the Ice Age. And they have been basically taken off the land and put here. The way these walls are surveyed today is by simply sticking probes of, of metal rods into the bog to try and define the pre-bog uh, surface. And in this case, we know that this wall does continue further up the hill. Now, at Cajia, there's a huge extent of 25,000 and more uh, acres of, of pre-bog walls discovered. But here we see a much smaller uh, field systems, probably reflecting the, perhaps the smaller community that lived here at Blaymore between five and 6,000 years ago. Okay, this is stop 2B. And here we have again another pre-bog wall, which is running down this direction under again the pathway and back into the, 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 the um, bogland again. It consists again of, of granite boulders. In some cases we have some red sandstone as well. These basically are the rocks that cleared off the land, as I said, to form the walls. And it's actually more or less parallel to the one we saw earlier at 2A. Now as we walk down the pathway, we come to the structure here at 2B, which is the quartz tomb. Now, a quartz tomb is simply a megalithic tomb, a form of megalithic tomb built by the first farmers between five and six thousand years ago. Core tombs uh, are one of the earliest type of megalithic tombs. A megalith simply means Greek for large stone and you can see very clearly they're obviously made of large stones. Now 
All that remains of this particular court tomb is the bare foundations because over the thousands of years we've lost the big court cairn which would, uh, of, of earth and rock that would have covered it and also the smaller stones that would have been inserted in between the larger orthostats. Now, the court tomb consists of a court which is, as we see here, a, a circular, almost circular uh, structure which runs from the outer edge where you walk in through to what would have been a chambered entrance into the uh, heart of the court tomb. This would have been covered over by earth and rock and stones. Now this cairn is said is long gone, but what is left here is the big stones that weren't moved, that weren't, basically people couldn't rob if you like. And as you notice they're made of a very, in, uh, of granite, but they're also made from splitting the granite. This involved using fire and water, a very laborious way to, uh, to try and split the stones, but they had no other method. They had no metal because obviously they're Stone Age farmers. In this case they would have laid these with a the flat side uh, facing inwards and created basically a chamber with the capstones on top. Now as I said it's very ruined, so you have to get a very uh, good idea only by using your imagination. Now the as we look, as we walk in, the chamber here consists in this case of one chamber, another entrance to a second chamber. But we also can see at the very edge, the edge curbing, which would have formed the outer edge of the, let's say the mound overhead. What these megalithic tombs do indicate is, first of all, they're uh, more than likely for a family base uh, unit, which uh, in turn would have perhaps put cremations within the tombs. Again, we're not overly certain of what they were used for, but all we can say is they definitely show a commitment by these farmers towards their future and their past, and obviously in some way encapsulate their belief system. We have another one later on in the, on the tour which is in much better condition, albeit it's under bog. So now we move on to the next location. We're now at 2C, and this stop again is a pre-bog wall. This wall is parallel to the earlier walls which you've seen, but in this case this wall is very well revealed and we can see what it's made up of. Now it starts again from the slight hill, runs back down into the, the lower end, and in this case we see how the bog has been exposed and revealing the stones underneath. Now these stones are again granite boulders that were been gathered from the topsoil and moved into these wall structures. They're granite, but they also are interspersed in some places with other stones that they would have found, including sandstone and limestone. Granite is something found in great quantities in the Kilala Bay area, and they came from the ice flows as they came, dragged their um, gravel and stones and rock all the way from the mountains, say of the Ox Mountain Range and further afield. They dragged them this way, deposited them as they ground them up, and hence we find an awful lot of granite boulders called erratics left high and dry. In this case, these granite boulders have been ground up and it said they're, they're now essentially rocks and the farmers have used them to put into the, the pre-bog wall. We're coming up to stop number three and this is the top of the gravel ridge which is the highest point of Blainmore Forest. Now, this gravel ridge wasn't always covered by trees. We have here a lot of conifer trees, which are the spruce trees of the Kilchit Plantation, and also some broadland, uh, broadleaf trees. Um, in this case, it's sycamore. Now, if these trees weren't in it, we'd have a great view, and unfortunately, we don't have that. But right now, where we're looking, this would have stretched right down into the lowlands. So it was a, a very good site to erect a monument. And in this case, there is one such monument here. It's a standing stone that was put up here by Bronze Age farmers. Now this is many thousands of years after the Stone Age farmers had left. Now we're at the top of the gravel ridge and here we have what's known as a farbrega, the false man or lying man or in modern parlance a scarecrow. And it's called so because the Gaelic speaking people who lived here uh, uh, basically saw this very large rock on the, on the horizon because all these trees weren't growing here before 1960. So as they're walking from their, their houses, they would have needed a landmark, and this was a perfect 
um, pointer because it was on the gravel ridge and you could see it. So hence, it looked like a man who obviously wasn't moving, hence the idea of a false man. But this is obviously far older than the term Fabrega, the Gaelic term, because this is actually a Bronze Age standing stone. And it's very significant. These stones were uh, positioned in areas of prominence. We don't quite again know their, fu their function, but obviously they were chosen for a very definite reason. In this case, this very large granite rock was chosen for its shape. It's obviously a clear phallic symbol. And also, right through the center of it, we have a vein of quartz running right through the center and down the far side. Again, a phallic symbol. Obviously, the trees weren't here. This would overlook uh, tens of miles of um, lowland. So again, it would have been, a, while it obviously was a, a landscape feature in recent times, it must have been also a landscape feature in Bronze Age times. And this is a Bronze Age monument, which means it dates from about 2000, 2500 BC or 4000 years ago. Hence, it's younger than the Stone Age farming settlement down below, which would have been um, in ruins, if it could have been seen at all, when the Bronze Age farmers came here. This is stop number four, Loch Nuila, the Lake of the Seagulls. This is a landlocked lake, there's no river inlet or outlet, and the bottom of the lake is actually very black because it's peat. This uh, lake was formed as the bog formed, so the lake itself wouldn't be as old as the Bronze Age or Stone Age farmers, yet it's obviously quite an old lake. Now, the area here, Blaine Moor, means on Blaine Vore, which is the large groin, if you like. And that was a descriptive of the actual topography of the area. In other words, the Gaelic-speaking people looked at the topography and decided it looked like the groin of uh, more than likely a, a woman as opposed to a man and decided that was the name. Now, Blainmore Hill, as we were on with the Standing Stone and overlooking the, the Stone Age monuments, is in the townland of Tanawadi Duff. Tanawadi Duff means the mountain hill of the Black Dog. And the black dog was this mythical creature. The Hound of the Baskervilles is a, an obvious example of that myth. Um, it's found in throughout Western Europe and it's basically the myth of a uh, fairy dog, fierce fairy dog who guarded the gates of hell or limbo or take your, your choosing. Uh, in this area, all that survives is the name. Whatever legends were, were here are long gone. However, back in Eris, there's still the remains of old folklore which have been collected, which suggests the black dog was actually an old tailor who used to metamorphosize himself into the black dog at night and waylay unsuspecting victims. Now we'll move on to the last stop, stop number five on our tour. This is stop number five where we have a combination of a Bronze Age monument and the older Stone Age monument. So this is the Bronze Age monument, it's a stone row. This dates approximately the same period as a standing stone. And what it consists of is essentially, in this case, four large uh, rocks positioned in a row, as the name suggests. Starting at the end and moving towards the front. This is the largest stone. And I'm standing at probably about a meter, meter and a half of bog. So this is actually quite tall, probably uh, slightly taller than I am. Now this is believed to be aligned uh, in the direction of Mount Nathan. And what's the theory, according to some people, is that this marks uh, a certain celestial event. That's the event of where the sun, on the shortest day of the year, is setting around the edge of Mount Nathan. In fact, rolling down the side of Nathan. And the idea that's of the theory is that if you stand at the end of the stone row and align yourself directly with each of the four stones, you'll be positioned right looking at Nathan as the sun slowly descends on down the slope on the shortest day of the year. Same principle in, in a way as Newgrange where the sun is, uh, rays are used to shine within the, the inner chamber on the shortest day of the year. This stone row uh, dates from about, again, 2000 BC, Bronze Age terms. Uh, it's significant because it also suggests that the, uh, these peoples were concerned with the heavens and the, and the earth, concerned with the celestial events, and also used the positions of the stars, planets and, uh, and sun in order to align themselves to their 
calendar. It also has somewhat of a mystical event because those particular celestial events obviously would have quite a extraordinary um, view viewership, uh, especially in the era when you don't have fireworks or any other or, or modern uh, attractions. We're now going to go to the older Stone Age monument, which is right beside the Stone Row. This is another court tomb, like the one we saw at the beginning of our tour. This, however, is completely engulfed by bog. And we can see how old it is, because the level I'm at at the moment is the uh, modern uh, bog layer. And now, I'm going down into the actual heart of the tomb. Right, I'm standing in the middle of the second court tomb that is on our tour. Now, the earlier one we saw was quite ruined. This one is different because, in fact, apart from the chamber I'm standing in, the rest of the tomb is completely engulfed by bog. In fact, you can see yourself up to a depth of maybe about a metre, metre and a half. This is older than the stone row. In fact, it could be up to 2,000 years older. So this is one of the second tombs of the first farmers. Now, how it's constructed, again, you have your heavy, um, very large granite rocks that have been split, so split granite boulders again. I'm standing in the middle on top of some bog and underneath that is the capstone. Now this capstone would have been the, the roofing stone of this particular chamber. And what happened was, during the plantation of the forester here in the 1960s, a local landowner gently asked the planters to move the stone that was, re that was revealed in the, in the landscape to move it with their machinery. So they moved it and it fell in and hence we now have our open chamber. Right, this is the tunnel that runs back in through the monument. You can see the sides of it there, the cairn. It runs back for about a metre, two metres. No one's got back into it yet. Pretty amazing considering you're looking right back into a five to six thousand year old monument. What's to note here also is the massive size of these uh, split granite boulders. These were split with farmers having nothing but wood and water and fire. It's all they had to, to use. And yet they've created the sides of this monument with these huge um, boulders. Uh, it was quite an investment of labour. It indicates how much they put into building these monuments. Well, that's the Blainmore Forest Walk. Thanks very much for joining me. And tune in to our next video um, when we look at other attractions from a historical and archaeological point of view in the North Mayo area. From me, Liam Alex Heffron, thank you.